When you arrived at MSF, you were shown around and told about this, about that, that too. You were probably thinking, don't panic, I can do this. And then you were told MSF is made up of associations, offices, satellites, regional hubs, sections, boards of directors, headquarters, operational centres. <coughs> Let's start at the beginning. If you'd been around in the early 70s, you'd have seen a handful of doctors and journalists who wanted to throw themselves into a somewhat crazy adventure that involved setting up an independent medical organisation to deliver healthcare to people in need, wherever they might be in the world. And so Médecins Sans Frontières was born, along with its principles of independence, neutrality and impartiality that are core to its charter. In the early days, MSF deployed doctors to natural disaster and conflict zones and provided assistance to other organisations. On the eve of its 10th anniversary, MSF began to spread its wings. MSF Belgium came into being in 1980, followed by MSF Switzerland, MSF Holland, MSF Spain and MSF Luxembourg. The original six sections of MSF. By the 80s, it was time to get more professional about our work. New tools such as protocols, kits, and even new colleagues such as logisticians, administrators, communications and fundraising specialists came on board. The so-called satellites also sprang up to support MSF's work in a variety of specialist technical areas. And to drive its communications, MSF France founded its audiovisual agency, Etat d'urgence production. Then, Epicentre was formed to implement clinical research projects, drawing on data from our field projects and epidemiological surveys. The same year, MSF Logistique arrived on the scene. Logistical and medical supplies were sent out from its vast warehouses to programmes in the field, so much cheaper and far more efficient. Hot on the heels came MSF Supply, set up by MSF Belgium. Speaking out, self-criticism and debate have always been important to MSF. And a couple of years later, the crash, Centre de réflexion sur l'action et les savoirs humanitaires, was founded. Then came the 90s, as the mobile phone came to play an integral part of our lives. Michael Jackson sang Heal the World and scientists played around with cloning sheep. MSF continued to grow. MSF needed financial and human resources to run its projects and improve the quality of its programmes. The original associations welcomed yet more sections, which, in the space of a few years, increased from just 6 to 19. To ensure cohesion among the various sections and reduce the risk of internal conflict, MSF International was created in 1991. In the field, MSF teams witnessed the policy of the extermination of Iraqi Kurds, the ethnic cleansing in former Yugoslavia, the genocide in Rwanda. Should we tell the world about these problems or remain silent? MSF spoke out, but not with a single voice. Sections didn't always agree on methods of intervention or how to manage missions, but most importantly on témoignage, bearing witness. Tensions mounted across the movement and the big debate began. Members from the various headquarters and fields reached consensus on ten core principles and the foundations on a common decision-making process. These are the principles of Chantilly. It's a turning point in the movement's history and the beginnings of its organisation at an international level. In 1999, MSF was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. The prize money was allocated to facilitating access to essential medicines. The Access Campaign was born. It advocates, on behalf of the movement, for cheaper and more effective medicines, better adapted to the precarious places where MSF works. Then, in partnership with several research institutes, to conduct research and develop treatments for diseases neglected by the pharmaceutical industry. MSF set up the DNDI. At the dawn of the new millennium, MSF prepared to celebrate its 30th birthday. In the prime of its life, the organisation was beginning to regret its very rapid expansion. Nobody in the movement wanted to hear of creating yet more associations. 19 were quite enough. But increasing needs in the field demanded more funds and more volunteers to support our activities. The MSF sections got round the problem by setting up offices around the world. Unlike the associations, offices are placed under the control of a particular section. Alliances were gradually formalised with five of the original sections and with their partner sections went on to become operational centres.
The time had come for the movement to establish a shared vision, as much medical as humanitarian, and closely linked to our mission of speaking out. Ten years after the Chantilly Principles, internal discussions led to the La Mancha Agreement that laid the foundations for international governance while committing the sections to mutual accountability. Several years later, on the occasion of its 40th birthday, MSF developed new international institutions. Made up of representatives from each of the associations, the International General Assembly, or IGA, meets annually to set MSF's principal strategies. This assembly is the highest associative authority. To ensure oversight throughout the year, the International Board regularly brings together representatives from the operational centres and other members elected by the annual General Assembly. Meanwhile, MSF opened the way for setting up regional associations to give our colleagues and members from countries in the South a more significant role. So here's what MSF looks like today. One international association, five operational centres, 24 associations, seven offices, more than 36,000 people of over 100 nationalities working in over 60 countries to take care of almost 10 million patients every year. All thanks to the support of nearly 6 million people without whom MSF would not be what it is today.